meeting now. Um, and again, I'm going to just do a follow. Uh, um, we'll, we'll try to, uh, I'm just going to do 20 minutes. I'm going to start with the, uh, with the uh, boring part first. Okay. <laughs> then we'll finish with the exciting part. But I'm just going to go 20 minutes and then uh, we'll have discussions. Okay. So we're just going to finish up this uh, little part on Hillman. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I learned a lot from this. And what, what I learned a lot from was that, um, uh, you, that, um, that just, uh, how, you know, how clear Jeffrey Raff is on, on uh, at least his book, Alchemical Active Imag Imagination, how clear it is on alchemy, but how clear this one is on Jung's purpose was to, um, to awaken the, the forgotten realm of soul. And the forgotten realm of soul, this third realm is, is, is the realm of images, you know, and he says psyche is image, you know, and the word psychology too, you know, is, is the logos of soul, you know, the logos of, of the word of images. Uh, you know, psychology, you know, is the word, the logos, the spirit of images. Hi, Tim. Hi, we're just getting in here started. So anyway, he, it, you know, so he, he shows so clearly. And I, I, I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but I had never seen, I mean, this was a real eye opener for me uh, that he shows so clearly how, um, what, what Young offers us um, and especially through his main tool, which is through conversing with, with um, inner figures, uh, that he rescues anima or soul, the third thing, uh, which is trapped in our dualistic universe of physis, which is the concrete, and metaphysics, which is the abstract which can be either transcendent or it can be just abstract conceptual in thinking, you know? So, I mean, he comes up with the, uh, this intermediate realm of soul, the realm of the daimons and uh, what, what he calls essa in anima, you know? Uh, it, and also it's it, it, the wonderful sense of imminence, you know, that, every, that, that everything, um, that, that um, this uh, sacral space that we contact in an act of imagination is filled with, um, with, with the energy of, of the center, you know, that we, we can have an imminent personal relationship with, which, which he calls uh, individual symbol formation, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, there was this wonderful little um thing i sent out where um, it, it isn't so important what the understanding of it is it's just sometimes the beauty is enough you know uh, to uh, awaken to be animated you know and animation doesn't necessarily mean uh, intellectual understanding it just means that it awakens energies within us and there's so many energies hundreds of pathways to these images and and that was what um you know once you open up the world of the daemons and the old word realm of the soul then you opened up you don't in in this world of the mono uh in the world where spirit dominates soul okay there, that's the other thing there needs to be the proper relationship between spirit soul and body and uh what young's complaint was or not his complaint but his solution and it was also the alchemical solution was that spirit and soul need to be distinct and they need to service each other spirit can't dominate and repress soul and what what young was thinking that in this dualistic universe where there's god on one side and and the world on the other and nothing in between other than um you know, the, um, the uh, um, authorized intermediary of the church um, 
at least in our Western world. And, and it's nothing against the church at all. It's just uh, the fact that this, uh, we're opening this up to uh, young, at least, no, knew he needed something else. And he found it through um, his red book meditations and stuff, w awakened what he called essa in anima, which is um, being in soul, you know? So, I mean, there was the two world system and we'll just go over through this uh, quickly. And then uh, we'll go into the more interesting parts after a little discussion of why we do it. Um, you know, the two world systems are spirit matter philosophy, science, God, nature, sacred, secular, nothing in between, see, mind, body. There's no intermediate realm. And the other thing you're gonna be missing in here is the, the, um, that, that soul, anima are full of humor and, uh, and humanness. You know, and I don't see a lot of humanness in this. You know, it's, and it's a uh, young, or Hillman says it's humorless. You know, there is no sense of humor in spirit. Spirit is, it tends to be, uh, uh, tends to be very abstract and transcendent of the human world, where the human world is full of elves and pixies and nymphs and, and tricksters and hobgoblins. And, you know, I mean, uh, there's this wonderful story of where the, the hobgoblins create this mirror that um, uh, uh, that if you anything if you look in it in it anything that beautiful looks ugly, you know, and uh, they were going to take this mirror up to uh, to heaven and have God look in it, and they uh, just to play a trick on him, and uh, he. Uh, uh, they got to laughing so hard, though, on the way up, that they dropped the mirror and it broke into a million pieces. And uh, if 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 any of the shards of glass got in your eyes, it would distort your vision. And if the shards of glass got on your heart, it would turn it to ice. You know. So uh, I mean, that that's this object of that. There's there's a sense of humor in nature. It's a this continual play of just this uh, of, 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 of really you know the uh, you, um, Joseph Campbell said the definition of joy is the inexhaustible energy of life invincible now that was his definition of joy which is uh, I think it's a good one but you know anyway it's just this upwelling 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 you know and uh, so um, that anyway there's this uh, it he comes up with the, the mediator of, uh, and, and some of the people who were, who uh, he was, he's really uniting the Neoplatonic Hellenistic world with psychology. He did this through the Gnostic, uh, studying the Gnostics and later through studying alchemy. Uh, and alchem, alchemical uh, alchemy is really, is when the Gnostics of, of, um, of Greece, came down into Alexandria, Egypt, and combined this, this Gnostic wisdom with the, um, the, um, the chemists of, per, of preserving the dead in, in Egypt. So it's this, this sort, of, sort of combining, working with the elements to preserve death, uh, dead bodies, and the Gnostic knowledge is sort of uh, fused, merged, and uh, so so it's it's it, you know and Young discovered this because he was as he was going through his his meditations he's um, uh, in thirteen to sixteen he wanted to find historical analogs for it you know and that's where he found it, is is in in the Gnostic myths where he saw individual symbol formation and alchemy where he saw individual symbol formation, you know, that was outside the canon, you know. And I often think, um, you know, um, too, if um, it, it is a very, it's a much different, um, our civilization as, as uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard Robinson Jeffers, he's the, 
poet from Carmel, uh, Big Sur, and uh, he uh, uh, said that civilization took a wrong turn when it when it started writing its history in prose instead of poem. You know, I mean, it's a different attitude. You know, and so then when you start writing your religions in prose, where do you get? And not only that, but they can't be changed. Every word is must be taken literally. And, and that's the one thing also about the world of spirit. It is the world of literalism. And it is, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, Jordy, I, you just were sharing something here, I think. Did you mean to do that? Okay, well, anyway, that's okay. I'm just gonna go speaker view. I don't know, I don't think Jordy meant to do that. Jordy? Anyway, I will just keep going here. Uh, Jordy, I think you'll figure it out. Um, so uh, anyway, so now we're going to talk about this, um, just this analog, he has two analogs of this attack, which he, uh, Hillman is talking about, of spirit on soul, okay? And the first one is through um, through was was through Carl Jaspers and Jung, where Carl Jaspers um, very uh, clearly really laid out the case for the world of, of the daemons, but said he didn't accept it. But everything he gave out was the best case you could make for the daemons. But that he says that's why we shouldn't uh, get our uh, information from from uh, uh, the daemons. But anyway, um, he's um, going on, uh, we're going on the um, image, imagism versus iconoclasm, you know, and I'll try to go through this very quickly. Okay. Um, you know, the law of the daemons is the being resides in powers. There are many gods who are perceived directly through gazing into dark, dark depths, and they are manifested in images. And this is what Jung did. He gazed into the dark depths, descended and found new being, which he called Essa in anima. And he finds soul by turning directly to the images. So then what is an image? You know, the, uh, it started out, the Empress Irene um, was somewhat upset because the Byzantine soldiers were going in and particularly destroying the images of Mary. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, because she was, she's really not that important yet, as far as, as the indigenous response to Christianity, her image was most revered because possibly because it was the most, um, most uh, absent, you know, and so the Empress Irene uh, of Athens, who, um, by, by the way, her uh, husband, Leo, died in 780. So she was then the uh, regent for her son. Uh, uh, and uh, through 780, uh, seven, uh, let's see, it was 780 he died. And it was like uh, the first council of Nicaea was in 787. And she um, wanted the theologians to say it was okay to have images in, in the churches you know, where they, uh, you know, sort of agreed with her, but uh, on the surface, but underneath, they said that these images are not, uh, they are only allegories. They're, they do not possess numinous power, you know. So they, she, what Hillman is saying is the iconoclast one. By the way, uh, her, her uh, son, who was supposed to be the emperor, uh, and she was his regent, um, cited against her with the church. And so she had him blinded and made herself empress. And then she is deposed herself uh, by her finance minister. <laughs> so anyway, that, um, so she's, she's, um, and, and, and they, it, he's just trying to, again, summarize what, what the difference between the dualistic world is and the world with soul, you know, the world of images and the world of soul, he said is illustrated by, by this, um, this uh, uh, where 
in the church, um, the individual symbol formation stops because there's no, there can't be a mediator other than Christ. So you can't do individual symbol formation. And that was, so there had to be these, these uh, firm uh, deadlines or, and, and so the, there, but you see that like in alchemy, that there was a sort of a bubbling up outside the church in alchemy as an underground um, mythology. So was uh, it happening underground in the images in the church you could go in and, and the priest would tell you what what the pope had or the um uh, uh what do they call it the metropolitan in the eastern church uh the head of the church is is he called a metropolitan i forget what he's called but uh they would tell you uh what their um, interpretation was but the images that were developing in the individual churches through the uh, were telling a different story. And that was, um, you know, needed to be reined in, you know. And, and, and the, very interesting, the earliest recorded statue of Christ was um, erected through legend by the woman who touched the hem of his garment, you know. Remember when he's walking by and, and he, he, she doesn't even ask him. She just knows that if she would reach out and touch the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. And he instantly knows, feels this power being drained from him and turns around and says, it's by your faith you're being healed, not by touching the icon of me. But, uh, but then the images said that Jesus was, was, automatically or Christ was an icon because he had uh, he had assumed form you know he had put on flesh so he had assumed an image he the only way that he could come into the world and incarnate was through uh, assuming an image so I mean they, they were holding out the images were holding off for this intermediary world of soul where the, um, the theolo theologians, the ones who were the uh, philosophers of God, you know, uh, could not allow this individual symbol formation to um, dominate. So they um, called it idolatry. When actually they, what he's saying is that uh, you only experience idolatry in the heart through literalism. See, the world of the soul is the world of metaphor. It's the world of amorphous images that are not literal. They're not, they, they, what's important in the image is not its concrete substance. That um, statue is Zeus. No, it has the qualities of Zeus and you can go talk to it and it will have Zeusian qualities. You know, and so you can talk to the, and you can converse with it, you know. So um, anyway, the, uh, uh, we just, I, um, I'm only going to take one more minute. And um, the, uh, uh, so, so the healing comes not from the concrete magic, uh, but uh, it comes from, uh, from, uh, from the imaginal body from healing the imaginal body, uh, healing of the soul body. By being attentive to the image, we're giving a metaphorical sense to our, uh, what needs to be healed in us. And, uh, uh, and we also have to be um, uh, care for imagination itself, or it will, it will be an ailment. Uh, and then he, uh, so they, they said the uh, latria, is, is worshiping, the, 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 these images don't want to be worshiped. They want us to be in dialogue, equal dialogue with them, you know, and which is called dulia. And actually therapy means to be in service to the image, therapeuin, and uh, it's to serve and care for the images and the honor rendered uh, uh, to the image passes to the, to the prototype. And so, the great mother, the self, the anima, the unknowable transcendent realities, 
beyond the images are meaningless. You talk to the great mother, you talk to the self, you talk to the anima. You, uh, if you don't talk to them, uh, their transcendent is not, uh, doesn't awaken the soul. You know, so th this is the uh, idea here. Um, I think we can discuss a little more, but um, why don't I, I, that was a quick summary, but let's do quick summaries. So anyway, uh, is there any, dis any discussion about that? Anybody have anything to say about um, the third? I mean, there's lots of questions, I know. But, I would uh, just m mention that the, that idea of, of healing uh, coming from a, a magic with the imaginal body mm -hmm. is a really powerful one. I've got to chew on that for a while. Nobody knows what healing is. And, and you know, the, my experiences with my loved ones who have, who have really struggled with uh, certain diseases and whatnot, it's, there's so, there's so much truth in that. The healing does come from the imaginal body. And we, that's one of the reasons why we can't figure it out. <laughs> it's, well, that, not that, from, it's not from medicine. It's not from the, the care of a doctor. It's from something that happens in the imagination of the patient. And I think, gosh, if we could, if we could spend a lot more time thinking about that part of our care, of our psyche, the the imaginal body. Uh, this is what the uh, the shamans do too. You know, they go in. Right, when, you know, right. they will pull out some aspect of you that is unhealthy. You know, and if if you cure the imaginal body uh, of the ailment then um, it, 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 uh, it has a, it, it is a metaphorical cure. You know, now the concrete and abstract might follow along and it might not, but trying to, trying to heal the concrete ailment is um, not uh, the realm of this, uh, is not what you're doing in, in active imagination. And it's not what you're doing when you touch the hem of Christ's garment either, you know, or when you go to the icon and you kiss, kiss some, kiss the Blarney stone, or, you know, you do whatever uh, is involved in, in that aspect of it. But, I can throw a couple things out there. Yeah, you know, sure. I read this book called uh, Cure and it was, you know, it was a science book and it's on the placebo effect, but, uh, you know, basically in there, they say, well, for the drug trials, you know, what they're trying to get is 7% past placebo. So if, if like, you know, if you're giving people a drug and, and you know, 60% are getting better with the drug, you know, and 53% and of them get better with the placebo only, then that drug is ready to go to market. You know, it's basically, it's passed the test. But the, you know, but the interesting part about that is the placebo effect, uh, you know, that attitude that will get better, uh, you know, is actually the more important part. And, and then they did a, you know, they did another study in that book where, you know, where they kind of, they, they measured, you know, sort of like the, the doctor's attitude, the, you know, the caring part you know, the bedside manner, if you will. And they found that, you know, even when the, the medications were the same, um, if, if you have somebody with a really good bedside manner, you know, your probability of a good outcome go up quite a bit. So that's just on the science side. But, you know, the, the other thing this reminds me of is, uh, it was a, a book by uh, Robert Bosnack, and I can't quite remember the title, but in this book, he go, you know, he goes to interview some uh, shamans in different countries, and I think this one was in Australia. But um, he goes there, and he's, you know, he's talking with the shaman, and he says, "Well, you know, tell me what it is that you do to heal someone." And and the shaman says, "Well, I turn into an eagle, and then I grab their, you know, their soul, and I carry it with me to this planet of." 
spikes. And he says, I then throw their body onto this planet so that they're, they're literally pierced all the way through by these spikes. And then he says, I go down and retrieve them and bring them back to this world and then they're healed. And of course, the, you know, the interesting part about that is that, you know, the, the need for us to be pierced, you know, the, you know, the, like the, that need to, to feel, to get through, to get through our shell. And, and he changed something that was in, into, you know, into a metaphorical type of uh, example. And, and yet, you know, if he was doing it in an act of imagination, you can see where this would have, you know, that effect on the, uh, you know, the, the imaginal body, if you will. Well, you know, the bedside matter is the anima. I mean, this is, this is the, uh, this is not spirit. This is this is relatedness, you know. That that is not this this very discerning by spirit. What what they mean is uh, is the uh, now. This is not necessarily what everybody would mean by spirit, but it, it it's this discerning, um, differentiating aspect of the logos, you know, where the anima is is the soul, and. By the way, let's always let's just for definitional purposes, all women have anima, all men have animus. You know, women, one one or the others are more unconscious of one and in need of it than the other. Okay, men are men are very unconscious of their soul life, and so they need it more than a woman who have a little more unconsciousness because of their close relationship to other beings almost biologically you know the the fact that eros was had something to do with the umbilical cord originally the the concept of of the passing of the blood you know uh which is uh, you know a very um unbreakable bond between you and another being where in the men's case this is not experiential to them but go ahead jordy what were you gonna say I was going to mention homeopathy as well, which came from alchemy, which is also healing the imaginal body. And I actually had a Jungian uh, analyst I was working with in Chicago named Boris Matthews, who sent me to a homeopathist in Madison, Wisconsin, who's, who spent about two hours talking with me. And it was a very wonderful talk. And then he sends me out for some homeopathic me medicine. But I don't think I think I was too uh, too much of a poetry turnist to understand it at the time. Though. But go ahead, Jordy. Well, uh, as you know, I am a medical person and actually compromised uh, at some point, involved, if you wish, into the evidence-based medicine type of of attitude and helping to spread it around and breathing about that. Uh, I don't want to be distracting, but there is a huge amount of confused material from the medical side involved here. I, at this point, I am at your this. Uh, I am available if you want, anyone wants to comment things with me, but I want, don't want to be distracted right on here. Now, I think I am writing on that matter, on the philosophy of epidemiology with a with a philosopher. Hopefully, I'll have a draft paper by mid-July. Now, one, one issue which is relevant is the meaning of health, which has changed in the last 3,000 years. If you take the Roman times, or the Greek or Roman times, uh, health is salus, salus salutis, is, is a greeting. It's, it's a way of saying hello, say salus. From a way of relating. It's a way of relating. Which derives the word uh, to salute comes from the, the Latin salus. Yeah. To show the, to greet. To your health, you know. Yeah, for your health, yeah. It's, it, it's as a toast as well. Mm -hmm. But it has a connotation. It has a political connotation and has a religion connotation from the day zero. And uh, really, the, the Christian religion grabbed that well. Uh, salus is salvation. Mm -hmm. Not clear from what. 
into generic salvation. And I leave it here. And salus means the will being of the order of power. When the Roman, I, I don't know if it was Caesar or Seneca or one of those, were discussing the health of, of the Roman society and the health of the Roman Senate, they had very specific, uh, say, political vision here. And the political dimension of health has been kept up to one century ago. I don't want to be a snob and pedantic, but the executive committee of the French Revolution, the one who decided it was going to be guillotined and killed, etc., was the Le Comité de Santé Publique. It was the Public Health Commission, the executive body of the French Revolution. That I mean, that's it's not trivial. This con these no. transversal connections of of, of meaning here. Huh? Now, in terms of psychosomatic or better mind-body interactions, it's uh, it's something which is at this moment uh, founded and and researched. From the experimental point of view, we know that within what it's called uh, the placebo effect, there are at least three different things involved. One is very technical which are the random variations. For instance, in, uh, in pulse rate or tension, et cetera. And if you put any put any cutting point, some people are going to get better, some people are getting to get worse. There is a random factor here, but it's measurable. Then there is the belief factor, expectations affect health. That's why critical trials are blind. to neutralize the two effects, the expectation effect and the interaction effect. Empathy, uh, Jungian helps here, other psycho, deep psychology approaches help as well, like Drachian. If there is empathy, people opens their bodies, their hearts, their, their curses somehow. Cursing is not considered normally in Jungian terms, but uh, there is something there. And uh, the effect can be powerful. The current research, which I, I do follow, it's to look the other way around, how to potentiate that. How to what, sorry, Jordi? To potentiate. Potentiate. Potentiate, got it. The, the non-pharmacological healthy interventions for health. There is a group, particularly one of the best groups is in the Diaconess Center in the Harvard Medical Network. Diaconess is a small hospital. They, they were the first who studied the relaxation response, how meditation is good for your heart and things like that. They do lots of interesting things that have been done in the last 20 years. It's a smallish group related to the immunology. And they're working active, actively on that. So far, being practical, no big deal. I mean, the bells won't, or the whistle won't sound soon. Uh, this the is healing, though, the healing that they're talking about, though, I think mainly is the not not so much specific diseases, but that what they say later that the gods are diseases. I mean, yeah. the idea is the separation that we have from our source is the mm -hmm. one that's in need of healing other than physical diseases. You know, I mean, there's the physical diseases, sure, but the the idea of the of this healing of this of the of wholeness, you know, is is isn't so much on the specific um ailment of a, a disease but the idea of that we are broken and we need to be put back together but um i just say that we you know you that um is another aspect of health uh, the one that young experience with most of his is or a third i guess of his patients is this experience of malaise and 
purposelessness and how do you heal that purposelessness i don't know the term in english but in religious terms some sort of a small type or not deep depression lack of motivation and there'd be like a lack of myth too the, 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 yeah, there is a lack of a, a meaning or a myth uh, some in, type of an image system, I guess. In, in, in a Spanish, ancient, ancient Spanish, it was called acedia or acidia. It was considered a sin. And you have to confess and get counsel. Well, get coach, uh, uh, priest co uh, coach, coaching, which is in, in church terms is not coaching, but whatever, to be under proper tutorship. What did the Protestants do? Protestants don't believe in sin. Yeah, okay. That's why <laughs> Young said he didn't see a lot of Catholics. Catholics seem to have it figured out. Listen, uh, I am not a practicing Catholic, but things like confession are extremely powerful. They are. It's very important. It's, uh, it, you know, uh, confession is very healing in itself. Yeah. I mean, it's unburdening. It is a wonderful unburdening. And, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful release. First, you have to articulate things in words. Then you have to face your shame and things like that. And then you talk to someone who don't know you and does some particular care to you. And the, 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 the protocol of confession is very well developed. The priest has not to discuss the matter in any detail with the confessing person. It's sort of a notary not to indulge in any sort of chit chat on the matter. No. And Young said, if you had nobody to talk with about it, then he yeah. talk with your stove, you know, tell yeah. your stove. Uh, but you know, there is, if you can find someone you can trust that you can tell the things that are, uh, this is, this is a very important part of, of my wife is very involved in, you know, yeah. in helping troubled women and through AA, you know, and, um, you know, I think it's like of the 12 steps, I think that, you know, either five or seven have to do with with um, the confessional. And this this is a very impart, important part of, uh, yeah. of analysis. And then the second part is is to have some kind of a relationship with um, you know, spiritists versus saints. Go ahead, uh, uh, Adam. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just, there was just something that I've been wanting to say, which is, um, it's related to everything that we're talking about. Um, you know, I kind of see all the stuff that we're talking about as like different roads to the same point. Um, and it has it's like, first, and I'm, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Catholic. The monastic situation that I was in was not related to Christianity, but for me, the the central image of Christ is like the experience that we all have to go through at some point, and that is the healing experience. Like this is just my point of view, but um, I relate it to, you know, he had this this point according to the myth, or if you want to think of it literally, um, of saying, you know. God, please take this cup from me. Like he, there was going to be some extreme amount of suffering that he was going to have to go through and he didn't want it, but he, in the end, opened himself to it. He said, okay, this is what I need to do. I'm going to do it. And so that for me, that's symbolized by being on the cross. And that was like a redemptive act. Well, that, that's I feel by, like that is that is something that we all need to pass through, and whether we, yeah, I was just just to finish here, um, whether that is by you know working with active imagination in order to come closer to the things inside of ourselves which are hard to see because maybe in the, they're in the shadow, or in a confessional situation, getting it out there, or whatever you know, I mean, in a physical sense. There, I can't get into the medical part of it, but I just feel like uh, 
I feel like it needs to be, or it would be helpful to acknowledge that, yes, active imagination is, is an approach. These are all approaches, I feel, but there's like a central experience, the experiential part that cannot be avoided if real healing is gonna take place. And that happens whether or not sometimes I want it or which technique I'm using, or I may use 10 different techniques, but eventually I have to get to that center point. <laughs> that's just a, it's just my thought about that. Well, yeah, and that is actually, uh, um, you, you know, in Hillman, you'll, you'll find in, in what he calls archetypal psychology, you know, he, he says it is only through the wounds in human life that gods can enter rather than through a pronouncedly sacred or mystical event, because it is only through pathology in the most palpable manner that, bear, that will bear witness to powers beyond ego's control and the insufficiency of the ego perspective. Uh, and, and, you know, Jung says this in the Red Book that only those who can touch bottom can be fully human. You know, in other words, someone who has experienced uh, psychic death, you know, uh, or some type of extreme suffering, you know. And I, I find that I, I did not get serious about this until I experienced extreme suffering in my life. I mean, real suffering. Yes. Uh, I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, regarding confession, uh, one of the important elements in confessing to a priest is that if a person thinks about how sorry they are and feels sorry about something they've done, that's all well and good. But it's only a two-dimensional reality. But when you actually utter your confession to a priest or indeed another human being, it becomes three-dimensional historical reality. Yes, that's wonderful. It's, it's it's quite important. And also we should keep in mind that these images that we've discussed that we've been discussing uh, don't only occur within us. Uh, there are external visions. Uh, there are individual waking visions and there are also uh, collective visions, for example, at World War I during the Battle of the Marne where the soldiers on both sides had a great vision, or the miracles at the Great Cathedral of Lourdes, which involved not only multiple persons seeing an external vision, but it also resulted in both individual and collective healing, because we're, we're we will properly acknowledge that we have individual souls, but there's a reason that St. Augustine said that God is the center and the circumference. Uh, the center is our own individual souls, but the circumference is the world soul, which encompasses the entire universe and all, all of humanity uh, together in one. I'm sorry, could you um, uh, please say again the World War I battle where this uh, vision took yeah, the place? The Battle of Marne. Marne, okay, thank you. There's also the uh, vision of uh, St. Constantine, who was an outright pagan and was converted to Christianity when he and his soldiers uh, saw a great vision. But the examples of collective visions, uh, there are uh, many of those. I, I mentioned the Battle of the Marne because uh, Dr. Jung was in, in the military at that time uh, during World War I, and it was quite a sensational story around the world. It's, it's the archetype. You, you, you know, th this is the thing, you know, Jung is saying the psyche is real, and uh, the idea of, of uh, sometimes in, in, in Celtic mythology, the thin place where heaven and earth are only three feet apart, you know, uh, sometimes uh, this is what a synchronistic event is, is this other side actually can enter 
and, and Jung talks about this in the last chapter of, of Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, the psychoid world. Now, it's a, a different dimensional world where the inner, uh, inner and the outer manifest in reality. And if you read um, the, the, the Wounded um, God by Jeffrey Raff, he will tell you about it, where they come up and thump him on his chest. And when they sit on his mattress, it goes down, you know, uh, and it's Sophia sitting there beside him, you know, the goddess of wisdom. And she wants him to write a book about herself. And while she's sitting there, his mattress is, is depressed and things start rolling down the mattress, you know. But um, so, and, and you know, Edinger said, this, this is a wonderful uh, little anecdote. Edinger said that people who experience past lives often, what his theory was, and I told this to Jeffrey Raff, and he said, well, that is just a theory. Edward Edinger said that if you experience an archetype very intensely similar to one that someone else experienced that uh, you two in that art in that complex or archetype almost merge and so suddenly now you have access to all of their personal memories you know and uh, uh, so so that um, is why they can tell you that you know facts that no one could have possibly known you know about it but anyway it's a very interesting there are what is it that uh, there are things in this world that who shakespeare says you know that we that we don't know about you know yet we uh live in uh, sort of a why, why don't i just uh finish a, a, just a little bit here and then we'll uh uh turn the last half hour over. unless anybody has anything else to say well actually just a, a yep. real quick question yep. you said on the on that shared archetype, is that from like a shared, I mean, is like both people go through an experience where they get the same archetype out of that and then they get- Well, this? yeah, they, they it very, very intensely experienced some daemon or some mm -hmm. thing where they are, they, they, they are the most intense uh, experiencers of it at any place. And this, it was such, a powerful event in this person's life that that archetype opened up to him. And, you know, like um, in, in the dream of Nicodemus, who's mentioned in the book of John, uh, you know, he says that, um, that there's this burning tree, an alchemical tree. It's the tree of, of images that, that, is, that is burning because of the attention of each one of us uh, towards the images, and when when it when that when that um, fruit is harvested, it is stored in an eternal warehouse, and that piece of fruit has a resonance that changes every piece of fruit that comes afterwards. In other words, our lives have uh, if they if someone has an intense enough life. It has a forward, now, now this is totally non-scientific, but there, you, you've got to say that uh, there is a, a forward-looking vision to, uh, to the evolution of life, that it's looking forward. Like in, in Hawaii, you have, a, uh, you have the, um, the honeysuckle birds and all the flowers are shaped like honeysuckles. You know, I mean, like the honey creeper birds, uh, you know, they because there's no bees on, in Hawaii or there weren't, you know, so the only uh, and they didn't have any hummingbirds either. So the only pollinator of the flowers was the honey creepers, which lived on the Polynesian islands. And so the flowers on Hawaii all developed to match the honey creepers. So they somehow knew somehow symbiotically they knew. So there's an aspect that that your life can inform future uh, resonances of, of development, that there's ancestral memory in the DNA or whatever. But anyway, that's getting a little wild, but uh, I believe it, don't tell anybody. <laughs>
anyway, uh, so um, any anybody else? And uh, what what I'll do is I'll just maybe just do fifteen minutes on why we do alchemy, uh, why we do active imagination, and I'll address Adam too. The idea, Adam, I think, is um, what Young is saying. What we're in great lack is an awakened soul. And he's saying that this awakened soul is not us. It is a, uh, uh, it is trapped right now in, in the concreteness of physics, which is matter, and the, con and the abstractness of the transcendent, which is meta metaphysics. And what we need is the middle realm of the daemons and the world of soul. And it's the, it, is the, it is the feminine world, by the way. The world of, of the logos is the world of spirit and the world uh, of matter is uh, what, um, uh, well, what von Franz says is the revenge of the mo mother archetype is materialism. And the revenge of the father archetype is, is rationalism. So the total distortion of the father and mother archetype is rational materialism, you know? So, so what Jung discovered that all these people were, were this, this, this malaise that, that especially occurred after uh, 1913, he discovered in himself through fate breaking through what he calls fate breaking through. And it is that he needed to have a relationship. His being needed to be in soul. It needed to be in this middle mediating realm between matter and spirit. And then spirit, matter, body, and soul need to have an equal relationship and they need to serve each other. And one can't repress the other. And the one he said that was truly repressed was this middle realm. And this is why I'm saying this article by Hillman was so clear to me and like nothing I've ever read. Craig? Yes. You mentioned uh, Marie-Louise von Franz. Yeah. And, and it occurs to me that uh, uh, we should note that alchemy uh, was not entirely outcast by the church. As a matter of fact, uh, um, many of the most prominent church fathers uh, practice alchemy themselves. Uh, and you'll recall it's Marie Louise von Franz who deserves the credit for uh, translating the writings of Thomas Aquinas and the, uh, his writing, the Aurora Cursurgeons. And she demonstrated uh, outside of depth psychology to historians that uh, Thomas Aquinas was indeed the author of this great alchemical manuscript. Paracelsus as well. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the idea of why the alchemists were actually accepted is because they were usually very great physicians or they actually also uh, were uh, a bit had uh, you know held out the possibility of creating gold. Yes, and also the uh, uh, the uh, dogmatic truths within Catholicism. Many of them were the same as the truths being found in the study of alchemy, although they may have used different terminologies. Both alchemists and the church uh, put a great deal of credence on the sacrament of communion and turning water into wine. Yeah, and, and, and the alchemists were very politically uh, uh, careful. Well, you know? yeah. They did and, not. Uh, they, and also men of who did their work with both perseverance and piety. Yes, they always would mention, I mean, they always tried to work within the, um, language uh tried not to be in fact they all that's and another reason why they kept their work so secret and there was and they also they considered themselves to be devout christians yes 
Yes, the the only um, aspect, and they that they held themselves out to be, but um, the alchemical uh, actual, the alchemical uh, myth is something else. You know, it is is. Um, but anyway, let's not necessarily go into alchemy, although I it is very, we can definitely go into it at some point. And this is really where Jung um, is develop, is getting his historical background, you know, and uh, of, of the world of soul, you know, and, and in, in alchemy, that's what you're going to hear is that man uh, is not to be, redeemed he is to re be the redeemer of soul which is trapped in physis well this is what hillman is saying is is soul has been repressed by spirit and matter and it needs to have its equal place you know uh, in in and actual it's the most powerful of the three and it is the one that spirit needs to be in service to. Uh, spirit needs to be in service to the images. It is not to dominate them. Uh, in, and you know, I I just went when I read this, I think of of Anna Marjula's uh, uh, animus. You know how he dominated her. You know, I mean, that he he needs to be in service to to the images. So this this is what uh, he's saying now on this thing, and this is this is real. I'm saying myself that if we really want to do Jungian uh, or to understand Jung, you really need to do about an hour a day, or at least thirty minutes a day, or as many as often as you can, conversing with the demo, conversing with uh, someone an inner figure that's not you, you know, and, and as you do it, you will find that it's some, eventually it becomes an essential part of your life that you can't stop because it becomes an important part. And yet it's hard, you know, and it doesn't, the, these things don't come easy and you have to really develop pathways like, um, like a Zen practitioner does. You have to develop the pathways of, imagination, which is the imaginal world of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of imagination, remember, means to, to, like comes from the root of magnify, and it means to expand consciousness. And so that we're a tree with leaves on both sides. And I think a tree without soul or a person without soul is definitely a one-sided tree. And I think this aspect, if, if we don't take anything else from Hillman's essay, it's the, at, it, it, it is the, at least the fact that the wor this third realm of the soul, according to Hillman and archetypal psychology is neglected. Yeah. And needs, yes. Yes, yes, I was just wondering. Um, um, in, in terms of Hillman's soul, because I don't, I don't know. So it was just, it's just a question like, in terms of Hillman's soul, um, so is Hillman's soul like images like, because Carl Jung, when he talks about archetypes and what I get from my reading is that archetype is more linked to spirit. You know, you don't want to, you don't want archetypes to invade ego because that's sort of an invasion of spirit into ego awareness. And, but at the same time, I don't know where the, for me is the, where is the demons like is the demons really what is when Jung talks about archetypes because yeah or yeah the arch the young actually says that the archetypes are demons he says, and he's are okay. demons and he says there's no reason I he said Jung said I have no reason to think mm -hmm. that the personality that I encounter when I'm talking yeah. with a, a demon wasn't there all along that I that the archetype itself had a personality he actually okay. says that uh, yeah and, and but again go ahead I'm sorry Confucian, 
I, th I don't know if it's Hillman because why Hillman? Um, so the daemon is related to the soul uh, for Hillman or for Jung or for both. Yeah, it is. It, the, the world of soul, the world of the anima is the realm mm -hmm. of images. Okay. It's the okay. realm of images that we can talk to, that we can speak with. And the realm of spirit is the one that takes them and somewhat um, uh, organizes them and discerns them and discerns one from the other. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, but that is just perhaps my misunderstanding. I don't know, because when Jung, even when he talks about the father archetype, he says, even he says that it can be, you know, become like a persecuting spirit, you know, the father complex, for example. If you're possessed by it. I mean, yeah. The idea is, are you possessed by it or are you, do you have a healthy relationship with it? So if you're possessed okay. by it, you don't definitely do not have a healthy relationship with it. So when we talk about daemon now, is we, we are essentially talking about archetypes, a relationship to certain archetypes. Yes, so. a daemon is, uh, Hillman actually says this and I can put it in yeah. there. And actually he's quoting Jung, yeah. that, that archetypes uh, like Eros, uh, who was it that told uh, uh, Diotima, mm -hmm. tells, tells Socrates, Eros, my dear Socrates, is a mighty daemon. You know, uh, that's what he tells her. Uh, you know, so, and, and a daemon is a, a real figure mm -hmm. that you can speak with, the great mother. Is a, yeah. You know, uh, the, uh, and, and you can find the daemons, um, now, now you, you don't want to go inventing them. You, you want them to come to you. That's what one of them says. It's not my idea to invent them. It's, they're, it's, it's for them to come to me and for me to talk to them. And, you, yeah. and so when you're starting this, you really don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> it sort of happens um, by accident. You know, I mean, my, the one I'm speaking to currently is uh, the uh, um, is uh, named Barbello, and she's uh, she's comes from the uh, uh, from the book of Judas, and she's the uh, she's the goddess of the four. And Judas, when he first meets Jesus, says, "I know who you are. You come from the immortal realm of Barbello." Well, somehow she came up in one of my dreams, you know, and so I started talking with her. But, um, and then there is, um, uh, let's see. Well, anyway, I mean, the woodpecker woman, and I find out later she's blind. I just found that mm. out. And I, I, I found out that, that Barbello is the black Madonna. But anyway, um, go, go, go ahead. I was just gonna. In the clove, um, wind, the, the book Windows, um, Windows of Into Eternity by, and, you know, they're full of images and there is like an image of uh, what they call the cloven man, you know, the wise old man with the hat and this, um, um, you can say, world wound, you know, with the splitting, basically. Mm. Um, I was thinking of that image uh, or that symbol, would that be considered daemon then in, in, in terms of? Well, I would say, uh, first of all, anything that you're considered daemon is not a concept. It is someone that you personally need to speak with in your own active imagination. It, for us just to talk about the daemons conceptually is sort of uh, organizing, but uh, yeah, yeah. But but the idea of the daemon is um, that it is a inner figure who you can converse with. Now, Young mentioned that they. Uh, are related to the archetypes, yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, a, a daemon is 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 an inner figure who we speak with, you know, and and so you know, really, it, it, when he's talking about polytheism, anima, shadow, yeah. uh, wise old man, wise old woman, those are figures in the unconscious that you can speak with and and that speak to you in dreams, you know. Yeah. So those. Those would be considered uh, the the um, figures in the world of soul. So the important thing here is conversing with the world of soul 
is is um, without doing this, it's you you are living in a dualistic universe of spirit dominating soul, and then just the material world. So, if you want to moisten this dry earth, it's, uh, you know, moisten this dry earth. What's missing? This mm. is what Young discovered. What's missing is the realm of soul the realm of the anima and the realm of the anima is in women and men, you know, and there isn't such a thing as anima, a goddess anima who only exists in the, for males. She's also exists in, in the feminine, but the feminine uh, world is more conscious of her where the masculine world is a little more startled by her and they are, and, and they have a much more primitive understanding of her than, than, um, but then, then there's the opposite with, with the logos, but uh, we both have equal amounts. One of us are more conscious of one side than the other, you know, but there, as far as, as I think their equality is the same for both men and women, you know, uh, but anyway, we're just going to go over why do we do active imagination, you know, um, uh, you, you know, what the the intentions of doing active imagination, which is the healing art. Now, the healing art is, um, is uh, the intentions are linked with know thyself, which you know is not know myself, it's know thyself. So it means that you are the witness to thyself. You are not thyself. You are not, we're not talking about know myself. Then there's no witness. It's know thyself. You're going to be the witness to this life that you lead here. And uh, uh, what else are we but witnesses? You know, all these things that are happening, but we're not really, you, you know, we can, we can create blunders that get us in big trouble, but um, these things happen to us. They don't, uh, you know, well, he'll just go in. So why should one undertake uh, active imagination? You know, and you could also call it activated imagination or numinous images, images that have been awakened or by the heat of ego attention. You know, that's what it means to activate an image, activated image, active imagination, activate an image. You know, that's what you're doing in active imagination is you're activating an image, you're making it alive. You know, you're bringing it out uh, of, of, of this um, of, of this unbelievable neglect of soul. I don't, you know, it, the, the way that we're neglecting soul is, is just a crime, you know? Uh, so, um, because it's such an important, it is actually, is, is, the, is the only, only of the only one of the three, body, soul, and spirit, that is related to the earth, that's related to the, to the rooted earth, to the life we lead. You know, it's the richness, it's the flower, it's the blooming, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, first of all, he goes through the negatives. Of it, uh, you don't do active imagination as a spiritual discipline. Absolutely not. Because there, there are no proscribed or prescribed images. You just work with what arises, okay? So it's not a spiritual discipline. It's um, not an, uh, uh, now we, we need to do, we need to take these images and uh, for the sake of uh, giving dedication to them and to realize their beauty, we need to try to uh, portray them in art and paintings and poems, but we don't do it for art's sake. We do it in dedication to, uh, and realize the beauty of the images. And it aims not at silence, but uh, at speech, not at stillness, but at sto of story, of conversation. It emphasizes the importance of words, not the con cancellation of them. And words and images become a way of relating the instrument of feeling, the internal talk with another who is invisible is automatically related to eros and through relatedness and bringing things together. 
Now, spirit will help you uh, kind of put them in in uh, in in order. But uh, this this is uh, the aspect of re it, they they open the world of relatedness and feeling to the inner world. So, in other words, we're developing a relationship of love, mutual love, between us and the inner world. The inner world loves us. We love the figures of the inner world, and we love them through personifying them. Uh, personify the objective. These are not us. They're objective. We give them names. We talk to them. You know, uh, but that you want to foster a sense of love into that. You're awakening soul. It's not a mystical activity. It's not performed for the sake of illumination for to experience samadhi, satori, or unity. He says, this imposes a spiritual intention on soul work. And it, it really dominates and represses soul by spirit. This is not uh, for awakening. Again, sometimes just the beauty is all, the only point of the image. Uh, you know, uh, then, then the, um, it's not activity in a personal sense. We're not supposed to be curing ailments. We're not supposed to be calming ourselves. We're not supposed to be improving our personality. He says, that's demeaning to the daemons. You know, they're making them personal servants instead of a, an, in, a, a, an entity who we're going to dialogue with, you know. And develop this relationship with, you know, the idea to have this relationship, by the way, is to create the symbol, which is something that's never been before seen on land or sea, which sometimes it's called the divine child. Sometimes it's called the, um, uh, well, I, I do. I'm just going to go two more minutes, Jordy, and then uh, we'll take, open it up. Right. Uh, yeah. I want to point out that um, active imagination is just not inner work. In the Red Book, uh, Dr. Jung writes regarding the inner work, but the spirit of the depths had gained power because I had spoken to my soul during 25 nights in the desert and I had given her all my love and submission. But then he says, but during the 25 days, I gave all my love and submission to things, to men, and to the thoughts of this time. I went into the desert only at night. Well, that, that's what Marie Louise von Franz says too, is she told this to Jeffrey Rapp, is that an individuated person is in active imagination all the time. Every single thing that happens to us is an image. And, and Hillman will say that at the end of the book. I, I can't go into it, but where what he calls the naklang or the aftertaste, uh, he, he mentions that everything is informed by images. Every single thing we do is informed by images. And this is, is what von Franz says too. Uh, so anyway, it's it, um, the idea too is it, of this dialogue and he doesn't mention it, but in alchemy, the idea is is to create pretty much what you would call personality number two or the philosopher's stone or the divine child. You know, it's, it's, it's the rebirth of awareness in a new uh, entity. Uh, and this is, this is um, and, and this new entity, which you can call the divine child or the philosopher's stone or whatever, can't be created by nature. That's what the alchemist says. The, the other world can't create it, and neither can ego. The only way it can be created is through this dialogue, through this, um, this aspect. And so it is, is really bringing, uh, it is helping to evolve the God image because now you've created this new thing. And uh, it's not theurgy. Now this is, uh, I think, uh, theurgy is magic. Now the, the, some shamans will use this. It always comes back against them, you know, they would kill someone with black magic, theurgy, either white magic or black magic. And the alchemists say that, um, that a theurgy cannot aid our return to the intelligible order. You know, in other words, if you're using it for 
to change the outer world. Uh, and I, Jeffrey Raff thinks you can do this. That's why he told me that you should never do active imagination with a living person or a dead person. And uh, he says, if you do it with a living person, it could have some aspect that's injurious to them, even though you didn't intend it. Um, now that's because he believes in it, let's just say. But I said, well, why don't you do it with, it with a dead person? He says, because you well awaken the realm of the dead in yourself. He says, anything you lend it attention to, you make more powerful. And he says, if you lend your attention to the realm of the dead, the realm of the dead becomes more powerful in you, is what he said. So now, I, I, so Jeffrey Raff believes in it, okay? You know? Part of me wants to wonder what's wrong with the realm of the dead being more powerful in you, no way. Well, it depends on how morbid it gets, I guess, <laughs> or how much, how it affects you, you know? I mean, uh, are you going to, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, he seemed to think that it was not healthy, you know, while you're- I mean, I could certainly see a potential for that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I, I, I took his word for it. I did it not argue with him. How, how uh, distant from living people our, our imaginations can become. I mean, if I'm, if I'm dialoguing with a character it's got to be derived from the people I've had relationships with, even historical people. Well, yeah, but these are going to be actual living, what, what the theory is and what I, I really think you have to assume if you're living in the imaginal world of as if is that these are, these are autonomous beings who you can talk to. That's the whole idea. And it's a, yeah. it's, um, uh, that's the world of soul and the world of diamonds. It's the world between the gods and the, and the outer world. And what, what they're saying, is this is the imminent world. This is not the transcendent world and it's not ordinary reality. It is the middle world of imminence where uh, we can speak with, with, with beings who are not transcendent and are not in, in ordinary reality either, yet have a, a very good friend who they confide with all in all ways. And that is the, uh, the transcendent being. So in other words, they, they have a relationship with the transcendent being. We have a relationship with them. And through them, we can talk with the, this uh, other entity, which is you know, remember, it's not really human. I mean, it created all life, you know, so it's, it's not really human. Uh, so just to finish up, uh, healing equals a, a return to the world of soul. This is, this is Hillman's conclusion. Healing equals uh, awakening the world of soul. And psychic consciousness, he says, is conversation with the world of soul and a healed consciousness is one that is, has returned to the world of soul and is having, there's no end to it. There's no product. The only product is know thyself. And uh, it ties in with the Earl Boros. And he brings up this interesting, which he thinks is one of the most in, important images in, in, in alchemy is the one of the multiplicatio, which is, that we continually return to the place we started and we recommence the same journey over again, but now with more subtly. So he says, that's what is eroboric about this thing. We're just going to be keep going, uh, recommencing the same journey over and over again, but with more subtly. But anyway, that is the uh, sort of, uh, I won't go into it anymore. Uh, uh, why, why don't, does any, everybody just uh, want to have a, what their closing thoughts are? And then now next time it's just, uh, we'll just on the, on the first thing of the month, every time we'll just, um, everybody just share whatever is interesting to them and just talk away and I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Is that okay? I mean, it'd be a way to get to know each other and everything. Go ahead, Jordy. 
housekeeping. What's the schedule for July? Okay. Well, the schedule for July right now is next session is going to be everyone just shares anything that they want to share. And uh, so there's no reading or anything. And the following session on July 12th, we'll start um, with Joan Chodro's book uh, on the compilation of writings by Young on Active Imagination, which would include the transcendent function and uh, a few other things he wrote, a few letters that he wrote to people about active imagination. Just a wonderful little collection. Be really surprised by what's in it. Did you send uh, us a link for that or something? Yes, I did. Okay. I will send you the link to the book. Uh, I, I, I think I sent it in the email, but I will send it to you. But it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful book. In fact, the introduction is very wonderful as well. So anyway, um, I have, uh, I, you know, we could talk about Hillman forever, but I think, I think the one thing I would say, take from it is, is that, um, what, what do you guys think? Do, do, you, do you understand what he means by the realm of the soul being neglected? And, and the fact that uh, it, what's being, it's being dominated by a, a spirit well, um, and, and matter. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of Hillman recently. Um, he has hours upon hours of recorded lectures on YouTube. And it seems like one of the things that he, I don't know, I guess in relation to that, he talks about just the idea of everyone being kind of just trapped in this prison of literalism. That yes. just everything is taken literally. And now there's no, there's no fantasy. There's no imagination. There's, um, there's no like story of the soul. I guess I would say that as if factor, um, because yeah, everything is just taken completely literally. That is what he's saying is spirit is always going to be literal. Spirit, uh, he says metaphysics and physics have something in common and that, that they are both very literal, you know, and, and where the middle world of soul is amorphous and ever changing and lunar and it doesn't have anything, any um, fixed positions because, you know, it's like Ovid's metamorphoses, you know, it's constantly in flux. And this is what Heraclitus said, that you never step into the same river twice. You know, it's, it's the fact that it's ever changing, ever changing. The images, the, 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 the creator of images is never going to send you the same image twice. She has too high of standards. She's not going to do it again. You know, so uh, she's, she's, the, the images she sends are ever new. And, 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 you know, if you, if you, and this is what, what Young said, if you take one of these images and draw it or paint it or do something, dance to it or do sand play to it, you will never be the same again. And, and he says, also, the next image will never, will be changed by what you did over here. So it's leading somewhere, he says, you know. It's going somewhere, you know. Uh, so, so that's that's the idea of that the world of soul is absolutely, totally uh, having to do with as if metaphorical, no literalism, and it has a wonderful sense of humor, a wonderful sense of play, a wonderful sense of color, a wonderful sense of story, of setting, of people in the setting. And how surprising it is, you know, sometimes some of the images that it comes up with. Uh, that, that's what they say you can always tell if your active imagination is authentic or not. Is did it shock the hell out of you? Was it totally unexpected? You know, if, if whatever happened was absolutely totally unexpected, then you know that you you hit on uh, some a pay dirt, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be quiet now. Everybody else, why don't uh, we just go around and have some closing statements? How about you, Gary? Closing statement. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was, this was a, a really interesting one. And I'm, I'm glad that you, uh, you know, you went through 
like, uh, you know, talking about the way to understand Jung is to have a, an hour a day conversing with uh, the daemons so that you can get it. Because I've always wondered, like, how have you figured out Jung so deeply? So that's my, you know, I'm like, mm, okay, I'm going to try this. <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, it, it can be frustrating. And, and sometimes when it's really dry and stuff, I come back even more determined the next day and say, uh, you know, uh, then I come back and I want to talk to the God of dry holes. You know, oh, yeah, it's actually the, why the you're God so, of... so quiet and so yeah. arid and so deserty. Go ahead. Right. Oh, well, just the God of dry holes. So, yeah. I mean, how much time do you spend there with nothing? Um, I, uh, okay, in, in that time, I, you know, there's been some times where I will just say, I'm going to just go jump off the cliff, you know? So I just run to the cliff and I just jump off. Other times, um, uh, you know, I, I will go sit somewhere and just wait. But most of the times, if, if I'm not, having anything done, I am going to create someone. And then I'm going to put my consciousness in them and I'm going to talk to myself, you know? So I'm going to sit there and I'm going to look at someone who looks like me and I'm going to be talking to me. I'm not, I, I'm forcing it a little bit, but I'm, I'm forcing it uh, because I'm trying to develop these pathways, you know? No, I'm, I'm so glad to ask that question because it's like, you know, sometimes I just get, stuck you know well i think that's when when i get stuck i'm gonna go look at myself walk up to myself and start talking to myself you know, right and right. and ask myself why you know uh you know i'm the god of cluelessness you know i've come here to assist you <laughs> <laughs> you know thank you <laughs> so i mean that that would be uh i would actually do that myself personally you know but uh M Marina, did you, you haven't said anything. Do you have any uh, comments? Uh, well, um, I'm still kind of absorbing. Mm -hmm. Active imagination is something I'm trying to get into. I, I guess it's wondering if there's a um, particular state of mind that one needs to, any preparatory work before well, one enters it. I can just tell you really quickly what I did from the start and I'm doing now, you know, is, is um, I just do maybe five minutes or so of, of meditation, just quieting the mind and everything. And then uh, I do the same thing every time. Now you can do, sometimes you would dig a hole and then when you get down to the end of the hole, then you start swimming through the dirt until you come out somewhere. And then when you come out somewhere, you just go with it. Now to begin with, it's gonna be pretty pretty blank, you know, but you gotta just keep doing it. And now what I do is I go to the top of the hill and I, I, I see a forest, sometimes more clearly than other times. And then I try to see what the horizon looks like. Is it dark? Is it cloudy? You know, And then I just, then I try to be the forest looking at me, you know, and then, then I go down into the uh, forest. I be, try to be the trees looking at me. And have the trees say things to me. You know, what would the trees say to me seeing me walking through here? Welcome, sojourner. Mm -hmm. What are you here for? You know, why have you come to us? You know, or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, so uh, yeah, it, it is something that you just do. And as we go forward, we'll uh, tell more experiences of it and and help each other. Yeah. Um, how about you? Trying. Either go ahead, Marina. Anything else? No, no. I just say I keep trying. Yeah, thanks for that. Well, yeah, just a little bit. And uh, remember, you're trying mm -hmm. to find the word, and and we're awakening the world of soul too, which is is desperately needs us. Uh, Lewis, did you have any closing thoughts? No, I'm good for right now. Thanks. Okay, sure thing. How about you, Adam? Uh, just a thought about the um, about the format of the meeting, which you can yeah, take. Sure. Or not. Yeah. Um, although I I find your insight really amazing and wonderful, you know, um, I also feel like the contributions of all the individual members is so valuable, mm -hmm. and I don't know if 
you know, maybe this meeting can can never be converted into a, into the format which I'm about to describe. But what I'm kind of visualizing is uh, a group where people share their experiences and insights, and it's just kind of like it's like a circle, and there's no one person who's like the authority or the teacher. Um, but it's more like we're all authorities and teachers and learners, you know, yes. together. Um, well, we'll you know. definitely do this next time. This is exactly mm. what we'll do next time. Yeah. And we'll do that at least once a month. Um, I thought other than that, we were, you know, somewhat going to read, read books, you know, too, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and try to learn. I mean, we can do it two sessions a month if you want to. Uh, you know, maybe we could do two sessions in a row of that and then two sessions of reading, you know, but uh, the idea is next week, everyone just shares whatever it is they want to share. What mm -hmm. is interesting to you? What would you like people to know uh, about the work you're doing? And I was just setting that up originally based on what Miles had suggested last time. Uh, so on the first session of the month, at least we will do it that every month. And then if you guys don't want to read uh, that, spend that much time reading books, we, we don't have to do that. But I, I think it is good sometimes uh, to, uh, to have some readings. And I mean, at least I get a lot out of it. You know, uh, I mean, this last book with Hillman, I learned a lot from, you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so anyway, what do you think about that, Adam? I mean, next week we're going to implement your suggestion. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to push things too, too much in one direction. You know, Gary, even no, just but shared it's in the definitely chat. important. Yeah. I think yeah. it is important. Miles yeah. suggested that, and I think it's a wonderful idea. So uh, we can actually do that uh, two sessions, and then two sessions reading, or do one session of this. Uh, what we're going to do next week, then do a session of reading and. We can alternate to uh, whatever you guys think. Yeah, would, or even. Oh, sorry, oh, go ahead. I would agree with Adam. I, I would love to have uh, some alternatives. I mean, we we naturally, when we meet, uh, look to you, Craig, as a leader. And there's there's certain leadership roles that we need just in a group to to be able to direct the conversation and so forth. But but I also feel this this opportunity that I don't want to lose, which is that what Adam is talking about, the you know, the expertise of all these wonderful people in this, yeah. in this format. Well and why don't I, we start we'll do every other session, we'll start we'll do one of these next session. And then every other session will just be an open session. That sounds and good. now those those sessions I'm not going to put on YouTube though. So um, we're just going to I, I can send you a link of the video. But uh, we won't, uh, those will be completely just with everybody here. So is that okay? Sound good? Yeah, okay. So next session, we will do, we'll do that. And uh, uh, you, you know, you can do anything you want. You can tell your personal story. You can just tell what you've been working on or what's important to you or whatever. Uh, so uh, how about you, Charles? Um, I have a few things. Um, one of them I believe I already forgot, but um, first I wanted to ask you if uh, you could share that uh, uh, Robert Johnson audio that I had uh, emailed you about. Um, yes. I'm very curious to hear his personal story. Um, oh, yes, I did. I uh, forgot about that. I'm sorry, I was going yeah, no on vacation. But yeah, what yeah, I will no do worries. is I'm going to send you guys. Um, he was asking about the personal story of Robert Johnson, which is very um, compelling. Uh, and uh, he uh, is, um, uh, has, uh, it's called um, the golden threads and I will send it. So it's all audio. So I'm just gonna send uh, that to you. I'll send that to you tomorrow. I am so sorry, okay. Charles. Oh, no worries, no worries. I was um, just going on vacation and I got- uh, Right, right, mixed up. But it's, it's like, maybe 12 or 13 hours. And he, oh, wow. he tells about, he started to go to India and his first, uh, his first um, experience, he was an introverted feeling type and his 
as he's riding along on the bikes in India, the um, p p other people on the bikes would reach out and grab his, uh, grab your hand, and they would hold your hand, and, and you would ride down on the bike together with these with this person, hmm. and uh, uh, then when they had to go left or right, they would they would bless you know do the uh, bless to you and move on. But he just said that this was he had entered his homeland, you know. It was the world of the feeling types, and they were really feeling types. He said the the East Asians that we see over here are all extroverts, so mm -hmm. we don't really get uh, to see the real uh, introverted feeling types. But um, how about you, Kevin? Well, oh, go I, ahead. I wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to mention one more thing. It, this is so, you know, it's not a. I, I I'm uh, comfortable with the quick answer from anyone also if anyone would like to share. Um, I know Jung said something about, let's say um, if an individual were to have a very powerful religious archetypal experience, if they do not integrate that, if they do not live by that, then they are bound to end up in a lunatic asylum. Mm -hmm. um, and I was curious on everyone's thoughts about that because I have personally had uh, a, a very, I mean, powerful, I can't even find words to describe it, but um, I've had an experience like that. And I guess, you know, that is my difficulty, like integrating it and living by it. And it was, uh, it was, and I've been trying to put together almost like a essay or a presentation for the group to kind of uh, give my personal story because it, my whole kind of personal story revolves around this experience with the goddess Isis. Um, I would love to hear that, Charles. Yeah, uh, I that's was. That's something, in, uh, something they're discussing here. But, but you know, we do need a couple sessions of people just um, uh, being able to express themselves. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we can find out the frequency that we want later. Right, right. But uh, why don't we at least do a couple sessions real quick uh, together so that we oh, of course because i think it's going to take more than more than one session for everyone to hear them be heard uh, yeah uh, and 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 we want to have everybody have plenty of time mm -hmm. so uh to to speak how about you kevin yeah i think uh what charles is mentioning is is, is quite important like Ed, edinger he was quite very extroverted about these experiences because there's so many that goes through them and they have no one to reach out to. And, and it's, it's become almost like, oh, there is some, you know, some certain people that might get experiences, but it's getting more and more common. And I think it's, it's things like this, even though it's most, perhaps the most personal thing you can say to someone. It's also very important to put it out. Uh, yeah, but what I was gonna say, what I was gonna say was, um, I haven't read much here, man. I read maybe one book and uh, two pages. That's all. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I still don't know why, arch like, uh, um, I don't know if it has something to do with this, but I still don't know why, why he made archetypal psychology. Because when I read Hillman, I read, a, I just read Jung, to be honest. There is just emphasis, but this is based from one and one. Yeah, book I don't think, I don't think he's a, he's a heretic at all. I think yeah. he's, He's uh, he's um, he is emphasizing uh, the um, the reality of the images. I think uh, mm. so. So, but I mean, he, it, there the book is archetypal psychology is not really written by him, but at least okay. the, the first first few chapters. Uh, I, I I send a link to that too. I think I can send a link to that. But anyway, it is. Um, I, I don't really find anything. Uh, I think uh, Hillman is, is they call him the jazz musician of, uh, of young in psychology. And uh, he's definitely irreverent, let's put it that way. And he likes to talk about everything. So, I mean, mm -hmm. he is, uh, uh, but uh, I'll send you the link on archetypal psychology, but we can talk more about him, but I don't find any uh, conflict with him and Young uh, a little bit, but so you get that from Jeffrey Rapp too. And uh, from everyone. <laughs> yes, I mean, a little bit, you know, uh, 
They, they called, uh, Anne Ulanoff called uh, Marie-Louise von Franz a hagiographer. Uh, you know, in other words, she, she was just uh, worshiped at the young's feet. And, and, uh, and Kingsley said the same thing about Edinger, you know, and uh, so, you know, that's, that's the opposite side. Of, uh, it, it, uh, yeah. yeah, it could be about personality different, but I also think people have different depths to understanding, you know, certain yeah. things. It, could, it, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just a projection of some sort. It could be also, you know, the depth of their understanding, perhaps also a reflection of their character, but yeah, anyways. Yeah, and, I, and for myself personally, since I'm really looking to establish a personal relationship with the soul, I'm not so, um, you know, hung up on, uh, you know, uh, con the conceptual side. I try to learn from everybody. Well, Jordi, do you want to have the final word? And then next time we will uh, just have a completely open session and maybe a couple in a row just to uh, get it all out of our, and then we'll discuss the frequency. Uh, go ahead, Jordi. Oh, wait, you're muted. On you mute you. Okay, yeah, you're muted, Jordi. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Now, I second the uh, laudatory comments. Uh, I, honestly, I mean, I I found the thing fer fertile. The f I think the word is fertile. Here, uh, there there have been many elements circulating on on today's, which are autonomous, like the power of the death, or the power of life, and the connection of life and anima. Mm -hmm. uh, anima soul, uh, anima spirit, this type of thing, which comes on and on and on again. Uh, each one of those can be, a, a, say, a course of sessions, not a single session mm -hmm. matter. Generally speaking, I think it's a good idea to leave the data uh, by themselves. It's, I think it's prudent, because if the some shadows of the data are here because there are unsolved issues which will affect how we play with our cards. Honor them and leave them alone. But that's that's for an, uh, that can be distracting. Concerning the relation of health, connecting to life, prana in, in Indian, or biophilia in Eric's from Parland, there is ample literature out of Jungian studies. And I will, I will bet, bet real money, that there is a clear correlation between physical health and all that. Once again, uh, one, pra one practical point, which has been going around my mind. Uh, diamond as an autonym and as an autonomous notion or idea or element or psychic element, as compared to something more generic, which is called the archetypical image. It's a personified archetypal image. It's one that you've given a name to. Same thing. So Archetypes it, are ungraspable by definition. Well, one that you can speak with yeah. is I, I, at I, least you can talk with it. Yeah. Yeah, you relate to them through images, uh, archety yeah. archetypical images. Now, uh, diamonds are more complex because it has have an element of inner energy. Mm -hmm. the, using the word diamond out of Jungian context, in the context of religious studies, etc. Diamond is something that will not give, uh, uh, let you indifferent. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's some that are called dangerous. Copy, there were the angels, the Persians, yeah. said there were some that were represent Akraman and some were angels. In, <clears throat> personally, I appreciate, I found it stimulating, and actually I do appreciate the small, say, tidbits when you talk to, what, what's her name? He has unplugged. Uh, which that, no? Uh, uh, Marie. Marie. Uh. When you summarize elegantly in 30 seconds what your practice, these sort of contributions, I do appreciate. Yeah. 
with uh, with Barbello, uh, and and she just came up automatically. I did not invent her. You know, my, so. my, my practice here may be different than the rest of the group because uh, active imagination comes normally through both this type of meditation I do practice. And instead of ignoring it, I give some space by the end of the, of the, of the meditation. When I am in really equanimous, detached, self seeing myself from outside, then place and then there are always elements that are easy to integrate in my case. But they are quick. I mean, they are. Uh, it's like when you pass a movie in accelerated speed. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense. I mean, well, you know, one thing Hillman. I mean, not Hillman. Raff says too, and I found myself is once you establish a relationship with these entities, yeah. it's one of mutual love. They love you, and you love them. Yeah, you will not abandon them. And so it really becomes a relationship of, of eros. So now you have someone, whatever they are, whether they're here or there or not, you can feel the love that comes from that side. You know, so uh, anyway, I don't want to get too uh, into that, but it, it, is, it is, is something that once you start it is, um, becomes, urge, uh, there's a sense of urgency on it anyway. I'll, I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, in my case, in my case, I am in the state of openness to the to the world, in in a sort of communion, Com, communion, mm -hmm. communion with the world, yeah, with 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 with, with the world, mm -hmm. not judgmental communion, work with chase and etc. And then those things which in many ways are hidden parts of myself. I don't feel them as particularly alien. But yeah, well, that, 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 was, uh, uh, that was Hillman's final uh, yeah. uh, thing that it, it really is, um, what he's talking about is a, a conversation with the cosmos is yeah. what we're doing. And it actually is a real live conversation with the cosmos Bingo. I, I mean like and that's if you want to do that uh, you can yeah. have one well uh, properly done say intense uh, Theravada meditation at the end is that but ask them how they're doing and and do they have any <laughs> what's going on <laughs> You know, I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, to have a, I mean, have a real a live dialogue with them. Yeah, yeah, but it takes a lot of practice. I mean, it, it doesn't. Oh, it me. takes a ton of practice. I mean, it, it no. really, for me, I mean, I'm, I, I think I'm just this far along, yeah. you know, on it. I mean, it's just like you have to develop those pathways. So do I. It's not easy. The ego is so, such a bright, uh, harsh light yeah. to try to, to make that light more lunar yeah. so that these forms take shape and come forward is not easy. See, you, the, the light needs to become more of a reflected light and not this harsh Ap Apollonian light no. I have anyway. One point which I don't want to be distracting, I reread again Hillman's uh, This a Strange Taste for War. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling which I found it a book not particularly well written. Uh, what, are you talking about the soul's code or which one? No, no, no. A secret love of war. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, he tries to get a little fancy sometimes. If you read his most rudimentary books, yeah. like the one we just read, and then, yeah. then the one um, on, on the Senex and Puer, I mean, there's a couple other ones. When he gets outside of that, uh, I don't find him that interesting. I mean, he well, he did the book on the Soul's Code, which had yeah. a lot of neat anecdotes in it, but I, it didn't feed me that much. Um, I thoroughly agree on the Soul's Code, and this love of war 
first, it was not well written. It was uh, so not uh, clumsy put together. And I had the feeling that he, that he had issues with many of the things appearing there, on unsolved issues. Uh, yeah, I would read anything that he wrote before 1980. Yeah. <laughs> I think after 1980, he starts to get a little sloppy. I don't know. That's just my thing. If you read anything from the 60s or 70s, it is just very solid. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it, and it really is just um, a voice you won't hear anywhere else in Jungian psychology. In this sense, in this sense, I think Jung is a slightly more astute. And even he doesn't indulge much in self humor. It's more detached. Yes. It, well, he, a, he can be funny, but uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah, he can go on and on, uh, sort it, of. Uh, a slightly more elevated. Pedantically, on, yeah. On, on the matter. And uh, this is it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, next time, uh, everybody just come with whatever they want to share. I'd like to hear more about Charles and Adam and all of Kevin and Gary or anybody wants to share anything. Uh, and we'll, we'll do two sessions in a row if we have to, but I think we should combine some uh, rigorousness too with uh, reading just so we're plowing along. Because see, what I'm secretly using this as is is a learning tool too. So I, I, I think I learned so much with just this Hillman book. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I learned something I never ever knew before. I mean, this this importance of this third realm and he, he outlines it so carefully. So anyway, next time we'll open up the meeting room about 930 and then we'll start the meeting. Actually, we'll just go as long as you want. We can start it whenever. And th this will just be a private uh, talk amongst all of us okay. did, did, did this open at 9 30 today uh it did uh lewis but it was just for chatting the the official meeting didn't start oh to that's fine because uh, the uh the notification on the healing descent site said it was starting at 10 a.m yes oh. yes that's true oh. uh i i should have said that it i'm opening i opened the room about 9 30 and okay. whoever wants to come and we can just uh, have a little bit of a meeting before the meeting, but okay. it's just uh, uh, for informal uh, talk. So anyway, next time is uh, everyone brings something they want to share and uh, or just come to listen to others, you know, so. Uh, that'll be the fifth. Uh, pardon me, that'd be the fifth. Yeah, July 5th. The fifth. Yeah. Fifth, next schedules are fifth and twelfth. Yeah. The fifth is it will be uh, I initially I was going to set it up just for this session and then the 12th we would have started with the other one but we'll we'll talk about that next time whatever uh, is the general consensus. Okay. okay well we'll see you guys all next time thanks so much. Thank you. Right, goodbye everyone. See you later. Bye bye. Yeah.